MCAT 2017 CRAM Critical Analysis and Reasoning Skills Passage 32 Seeing Color Through Homer's Eyes As you view the reading of the passage, you'll notice some highlighted snippets of text. What I want you to do is garner meaning from these specific selections in order to answer the foundations of comprehension, reasoning beyond the text, and reasoning within the text questions that follow. Good luck and happy reading! Paragraph 1. For someone used to contemporary academic writing, reading the chapter on color in William Gladstone's Studies on Homer and the Homeric Age, 1858, comes as rather a shock, the shock of meeting an extraordinary mind. It is therefore all the more startling that Gladstone's 19th century tour de force, tour de force meaning an impressive performance or achievement that has been accomplished or managed with great skill comes to such a strange conclusion. Homer and his contemporaries perceive the world in something closer to black and white than to full technicolor. Paragraph 2. No one would deny that there is a wide gulf between Homer's world and ours. In the millennia that separate us, Empires have risen and fall, religions and ideologies have come and gone, and science and technology have transformed our intellectual horizons and almost every aspect of our daily life beyond all recognition. Surely one aspect that must have remained exactly the same since Homer's day, even since time immemorial, would be the rich colors of nature. The blue of sky and sea, the glowing red of dawn, the green of fresh light. Paragraph 3. Gladstone says things are not the same for many reasons. One, Homer uses the same world to denote colors, which, according to us, are essentially different. For example, he describes as violet the sea, sheep, and iron. Two, Homer's similes are so rich with sensible imagery. We expect to find a color, to find color a frequent and prominent ingredient, and yet his poppies have never so much a hint of scarlet. Three, three, Gladstone notes Homer uses black about 170 times, white 100 times, red 13, yellow 10, violet six times, and the other colors even less often. Four, Homer's color vocabulary is astonishingly small. There doesn't seem to be anything equivalent to our orange or pink in Homer's color palette. Most striking is the lack of any word that could be taken to mean blue. What is more, Gladstone proves that the oddities in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey could not have them from any problems peculiar to Homer. Violet colored hair was used by Pindar in his poems. Paragraph 4. Gladstone is well aware of the utter weirdness of his thesis, nothing less than universal color blindness among the ancient Greeks, so he tries to make it more palatable by evoking an evolutionary explanation for how sensitivity to colors could have increased over the generations. The perception of color, he says, seems natural to us only because humankind, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, humankind um, as a whole has undergone a progressive education of the eye. Over the last millennia, the eye's ability to perceive and appreciate differences in color, he suggests, can improve with practice, and these acquired improvements are then passed on to offspring. Paragraph 5. But why, one may well ask, should this progressive refinement of color vision not have started much earlier than the Homeric period? Gladstone's theory is that the appreciation for color as a property independent of a particular material 
develops only with the capacity to manipulate colors artificially. And that capacity, he notes, barely existed in Homer's day. The art of dyeing was in its infancy, cultivation of flowers was not practiced, and almost all of the brightly colored objects we take for granted were entirely absent. Other than the ocean, people in Homer's day may have gone through life without ever setting their eyes on a single blue object. Blue eyes, Gladstone explains, were in short supply. Blue dyes, which are very difficult to manufacture, were particularly unknown, and natural flowers that are truly blue are rare. Paragraph six. Gladstone's analysis was brilliant, but completely off course. Indeed, philologists, philology is the study of language in written historical sources. It is a combination of literary criticism, history, and linguistics, and it's more commonly defined as the study of literary texts and written records, basically the establishment of their authenticity and their original form and the determination of their meaning. Note this is not a part of the original text, it's just for um, better understanding, okay? So philologists, anthropologists, and even natural scientists would need decades to free themselves from the era of underestimating the power of culture. All right. It can be inferred from the passage that the author believes which of the following about contemporary academic writing? Is it A, academic papers are typically not especially brilliant? Is it B, academics seldom address color perception in their papers? Is it C, academics often reach very strange conclusions in their papers? Or is it D, Academic papers are usually outdated soon after they are written. I'll give you a moment to think. All right. This is the Foundations of Comprehension question. Um, which means that it wants you to understand the ideas put forth by the author in the passage, okay? The author begins the passage by saying that, quote, for someone used to contemporary academic writing, reading chap the chapter on color in William Gladstone's Studies of Homer in the Homeric Age, 1858, comes as rather a shock, the shock of meeting an extraordinary mind. That's so insulting at the same time. So this is mentioned in paragraph one. If someone used to reading contemporary academic writing is shocked at reading something extraordinary, then the implication is that academic papers are typically not especially brilliant, which is mentioned in answer choice A. All right, so the passage doesn't directly deal with the prevalence of color perception as content in academic writing, so answer choice B is incorrect. Um, the author refers to strange, to the strange conclusion that Gladstone reaches as being shocking, but doesn't assert that um, the conclusions of most academic writings are very strange, okay? So this is, yeah, that's out, and although this is a little cut, and um, the other doesn't discuss the ideas that papers may quickly become outdated. All right? Okay. It has been suggested that the Iliad and the Odyssey were a patchwork of a great number of popular ballads woven together from different poets, rather than a single work by a poet named Homer. If true, how would this affect the opinions expressed in the passage? A, it would strengthen Gladstone's basic thesis. B, it would weaken Gladstone's basic thesis. C, 
It would require modification of Gladstone's basic thesis for D. It would not affect Gladstone's basic thesis. I'll give you a moment to think. Okay, so this is a reasoning beyond the text question, um, which means that it wants you to extrapolate the ideas in the passage to the new situation presented in the question stem. Okay, Gladstone's basic thesis is that, quote, Homer and his contemporaries perceive the world in something closer to black and white than to full technicolor. So this is mentioned in paragraph one and that there was a universal color blindness among the ancient Greeks, that's mentioned in paragraph four. If the Iliad and Odyssey were a patchwork composed by a great number of writers, then it would help to show that a group of individuals use a restricted range of colors in their writings rather than just a single individual, Homer or two, Pindar, who's also mentioned. This means that the correct answer choice is answer choice A. This would greatly strengthen Gladstone's basic thesis because it would suggest that the quote, oddities in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey could not have been stemmed from any problem peculiar to Homer. Okay, that you can find in paragraph three. And that's it. Gladstone would predict which of the following about the children of an interior decorator who easily distinguishes among scarlet and burgundy. A, the children would be able to easily distinguish various versions of red. B, the children would be drawn more to objects in various versions of red than to those of any other color. Um, C, the children would sell them Father mentioning what are to them obvious differences among various versions of red. I'll give you a moment to think. Okay, again, this is a reasoning beyond the text question. Apply the ideas mentioned in the passage to the new situation in the question stem. Gladstone suggests that the eye can be trained and that using and manipulating colors helps humankind to learn how to appreciate nuances. Nuances meaning small, subtle differences in shade. Nuances basically in color. This is mentioned in paragraph four. Furthermore, the thesis includes the idea that these acquired improvements are then passed off to offspring. Also mentioned in paragraph four. So the statement suggests that children of an interior decorator would be similarly easily able to distinguish between various versions of red. So the correct answer choice is answer choice A. All right? Okay. Homer's sky is starry or broad or great or iron or violet, but it is never blue. How does this affect the opinions expressed in the passage? One, it supports Gladstone's claim regarding Homer's use of color. Two, it extends Gladstone's claim regarding Homer's, Homer's focus on nature. Or three, it challenges Gladstone's claim regarding Homer's penchant for strange imagery. So is it A, one only, B, two only, C, one and two only, or G, two and three only. I'll give you a moment to think. All right, again, it's the reasoning beyond a text question. Apply the ideas mentioned to the passage to this new situation here, okay? Actually, I think the situation might be mentioned to some extent in the passage, but whatever. Gladstone describes Homer's use of descriptions of color as limited and notes that it was unlikely that people in Homer's generation experienced the color blue frequently. You can find this mentioned in paragraph three. So the example showing the kinds of words that Homer uses to describe the, the not chi, sky, 
I think that's my accent coming up. Supports Gladstone's claim regarding Homer's limited use of color. So statement one is on the money. And that's the correct answer choice, A, one only. So for, as for the others, the author doesn't discuss any claims made by Gladstone about Homer's focus on nature. This just wasn't spoken of. And Gladstone suggests that Homer's similes are rich with sensible imagery, so strange imagery doesn't apply here as well, okay? All right.